human trafficking and human slavery, which is something uh, that affects about 40 million plus people in the world today are basically the equivalent of slaves. Hey, welcome to Unleashed, the show that explores how to thrive as an independent professional. I'm your host, Will Bachman. Unleashed is produced by Umbrex, the first global community connecting top-tier independent management consultants with one another. We just heard from today's guest, Andrea Bonim Blanc, a leading global expert in the area of risk management and the author of five books, including the recently published Gloom to Boom, How Leaders Transform Risk into Resilience and Value. Gloom to Boom expands the traditional risk management framework of ESG, which stands for environmental, social, and governance risks, by adding technological risks, so the acronym gets expanded to ESGT. In our discussion today, we talk about her latest book and her work consulting to board directors on risk management. To learn more about Andrea's practice, visit gecrisk.com. And that link is in the show notes. Hello, Andrea. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Will. It's great to be here. So, Andrea, in your latest book, Gloom to Boom, How Leaders Transform Risk into Resilience, you talk about six types of companies, including a company that you've referred to as the Mafia Company. Give us that overview of those six types of companies real quick. I'd love to hear you talk about that array that you came up with. Sure. So it, it's in the last chapter of the book, so it builds on everything that came before. So uh, I just want to mention that uh, as, as, a, as a data point since the book is 460 pages long. But the apotheosis of the book is uh, this last sort of typology of organizations which is basically modeled around two major concepts. One is leadership and the other is organizational resilience. And the leadership piece, what I'm looking at is how do the leaders of a specific company or business approach the topics within the the rubric of ESG, meaning environmental, social, and governance, and I've added a T for technology, so I call it ESGNT, and that's a large por- portion of the book. So how does your leadership deal with ESGNT issues? Do they deal really brilliantly with them or okay with them or terribly with them? So that's one uh, criteria. And the other criteria is how is your organization organized for purposes of resilience building and sustainability and creating value for the most stakeholders? So you put those two together, and that's where I have my six uh, types of companies or organizations, and they range from the, the lowest end, which I call the outlaw organization, to the best and most highly functional and successful, which is the transformational organization. So I can talk a little more about those details if you like, but I'll leave it at that so you can get a word in edgewise. Okay, sure. Let's 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 talk about each end of the spectrum. So the outlaw organization. How would you w- characterize those? And maybe if you're if you're willing to give us a, an example or two, of course I can give you a couple of examples uh, of of each of these. Uh, basically, the outlaw organization has leadership that doesn't, uh, to be very blunt, give a damn about ESG and T issues. They're only concerned with whatever their outcome is in terms of what whatever their goal is. So if it's the most money or the most uh, you know uh, trade. And the outlaw organization, by definition, is uh, an illegal organization. So that could be a mafia, for example. It could be, uh, if you remember a few years ago, there was a internet-based sort of illegal trading drug and an arms trading company called Silk Road. Silk Road, sure. Yeah. And so, you know, it's 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 an organization like that where the leadership is basically uh, doesn't care at all about the issues that fall under those four categories and doesn't really care about organizational resilience, except to the extent that they have what they need to to accomplish their goals. Um, and that means, you know, having streamlined supply chains and, and things like that. But it doesn't mean having uh, a good culture or, you know, good governance or good risk management, except for maybe, uh, you know, uh, figuring out risks involved with uh, getting caught by the by the police <laughs> or the you know, or the authorities. So, so that's the outlaw organization in a nutshell. Let's talk about the transformative organization. So the transformative organization is the other end of the spectrum. And there you have 
highly evolved, what I like to call enlightened leadership. And that enlightened leadership is usually, um, you know, a CEO, a board, a C-suite uh, management team that really takes ESG and T issues seriously. They know what their environmental issues are, their social issues, governance, technology, and they uh, not only uh, you know talk the talk, they talk the they walk the talk basically in the sense that they provide resources, they provide leadership tone from the top on whatever those issues are that pertain to them. So if you're talking about, uh, and one of my my examples in my book is Microsoft. If you're talking about Microsoft, it's about putting in the resources, the structures, the programs, the people necessary to be able to really have good risk management, have good sustainability, have good um, AI ethics in their case, for example, uh, and, and developing the right kind of tone from the top for those kinds of things. And then that also means having all of those elements of organizational resilience that I outline in one of the chapters of the book, which are eight in, in good form, sort of uh, working like a well-oiled machine or uh, like clockwork, basically. Let's talk about each of these elements, ESG and T. So environment, beyond kind of meeting the minimum standards of the law of the Clean Water Act or the Clean Air Act, what are the kind of business advantages of going above and beyond sort of the minimum that the law requires for, for a company? Sure. Um, so, you know, uh, we can think about examples from the past like BP and Deepwater Horizon, and we can think about uh, current examples like PG&E's bankruptcy in California due to uh, a lot of negligence, apparently, and other issues that have accumulated in the environmental space. So in some cases, uh, it's illegal, civil or criminal violations taking place with regard to the environment. So that is the, the worst end of the spectrum. That's where the companies are not even living up to some of the legal and regulatory expectations. But on the other end of the spectrum are companies that are taking some of these things seriously and developing sustainable products and, and services where they integrate uh, green uh, issues and uh, they integrate you know, improvements uh, to the environment or improvements to uh, various products and services that they create. So Unilever is a really good example of a company that has done that for several years. Not only did they look at uh, creating a more sustainable business strategy, but they embedded it into some of their products and services. And they also did some uh, revolutionary things that uh, I think you know, put them in the high high end of the of the spectrum of transformative and responsible companies, where they decided to only do their financial reporting once a year, so that they could focus on the long term and not just on quarterly earnings. So those are just quick examples of uh, the spectrum of of risk to opportunity that I like to try to in this, illustrate in the chapters. Each of those chapters. You know, and, and I'll just give you a couple more examples in the case of, of the environmental chapter. I don't only talk about the low end and the risk on wrong cases, but I also talk about some of the very innovative things that are happening. There's companies that are plastic eating worms that they're developing, for example, to eliminate the plastic disasters that we have in this uh, in this world right now in terms of oceans full of plastic and ecological problems of, of some uh, great import. So there are companies that are trying to create alternatives that are sustainable, that are environmentally friendly. So one of the things I try to do in each of these chapters is really uh, accentuate not just the, the downside, but also the upside that allows you to develop new products and services, improved products and services uh, that are more environmentally friendly, and so on. Great. Within the social category, Tell us a little bit about what that encompasses. Sure. If, you, if you're if you talking about, you know, when you look at the, the categories of, of uh, environmental, social governance and technology, there's a lot of issues that are embedded in under each of those categories. And under so social, you can find all the human rights related issues, uh, child labor, slave labor, uh, forced labor. Uh, you can find uh, health and safety issues uh, are very important in, in uh, under that category. And so what I've done in, in that chapter is talk about some of the really grotesque stories that are out there. And, and I focus very heavily on a topic that not everybody pays attention to, but all of us have some responsibility for, and that is human trafficking and human slavery. 
which is something uh, that affects about 40 million plus people in the world today are basically the equivalent of slaves. And there are different categories under that. But the bottom line is uh, we all end up supporting that in indirect and unconscious ways because, for example, a couple of the industries that I mentioned, the fishing industry is one of them uh, where there's a lot of slave labor and it's a horrific sort of um, area uh, for human rights abuse. And it's basically about uh, fishing fleets that are out in the Pacific Ocean, for example, that have slave labor from some of the poorer Asian-based countries. And uh, there was an expose in the New York Times a few years ago about this, and it, it's a really horrific thing. And so we end up, you know, getting cheaper fish in uh, the canned tuna or fresh fish because these people are out there working in these uh, unknown fleets uh, and often losing their lives or being severely injured. So human trafficking, and human slavery is one of the topics I talk about in that chapter. Um, but I also talk about how there are certain industries that are really improving their record on this. And the hotel industry is a really good example. Uh, you know, I give several examples of uh, like Marriott, for example, and others who have learned the hard way, but they've learned. And this is a great thing because in hotels, you often have prostitution rings and you have other kinds of uh, potential uh, human trafficking and, um, you know, slave labor. And uh, the hotel industry has actually stepped up to the plate in a very proactive way in the last 10 years or so to make sure that this uh, is not happening in their hotels. And if it is happening, that there are, you know, ways to speak up, uh, even have people, you know, uh, call a number, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I try to always show the, the upside and the downside or the downside and the upside and get people to think about, you know, how they can make improvements despite the difficulties that, you know, that, that we're facing. Yeah. So as you advise boards of directors and the senior leadership of companies on these matters, let's talk about environment and social. It's uh, what should a member of a board of directors be doing or the board of directors risk committee be doing on the issue of social? Like how do you make sure that you are not supporting you know, human slavery or, you know, these terrible work conditions. It's some part of your company somewhere in the world. How, how does a company go about, go about, you know, investigating that and, 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 and seeing if they're somehow involved in it in some division in some country somewhere in the world? Well, great question. And, and this is something where I think boards are weak. And it's one of my missions in life is to get boards of directors to really understand much better than they do the ES, GNP issues that, that affect their particular business. And I agree that ENS, are, are, especially the S, is, is an area that's difficult and challenging. But really where it all lies to me at the end of the day is, first of all, you have to know your business well and, and you know where your talent or your people or your supply chain goes, those kinds of things. Uh, so understanding the business is obviously a, a, a critical part of that. So once you understand what the business is, then you can understand what the social issues might be. You know, if you're a Boeing, your social issues are health and safety. If you're Walmart, uh, in terms of the retail clothing industry, for example, you want to know where your supply chain goes. Uh, does it go into places uh, like Bangladesh, um, where, you know, we've seen some horrific accidents and buildings that didn't uh, weren't built to code where people died so you have to know you know the the sort of the contours of your business in the first place to understand what the social issues are not to mention the other e g and t issues but social often gets left sort of you know uh, to the to the side until the scandal happens so that's number one number two uh, I can't say this enough. I don't think there are enough people on boards that have the right background to think about these issues and ask about these issues. Uh, we have mostly CEOs and CFOs. We don't have people uh, who have uh, corporate responsibility, risk management, compliance, regulatory, government affairs. Those kinds of people don't usually sit on boards, although I really believe that you need to have uh, a couple of people like that on every single board because otherwise boards are missing out on some of the key issues that are important to their business strategy and to their success for their shareholders and their stakeholders. 
So secondly, I think, uh, is the idea that you need to have a more diverse board with people who know what questions to ask and what to ask for, you know, in terms of what management is doing. I think beyond that, it's really up to management to have a good risk management program in place that incorporates ESG and T issues. And that's another big area of uh, gap, I think, for a lot of companies, maybe not the very biggest and the most in the spotlight, but a lot of companies don't have a decent risk management program in, in place or an enterprise risk management program in place that is useful and customized to their footprint. Yeah. So a question on that is, on the financial side, you know, boards will engage one of the big, you know, CPA auditing firms to do obviously the the audit of the financials and ensure there's proper financial controls. Are there firms that will do kind of the equivalent for like a social audit of the company? Yes. Yes, absolutely. And you know, they're probably more uh, they're smaller, more specialized, and even the big 4 uh, have parts of their business, uh, the consulting side of their business that often do this kind of work. And so the people are there, the consultants and the experts are there. I think what's not always there is the will to do this. And I'll give you an example. You know, when the Rana Plaza disaster occurred in Bangladesh uh, a few years ago, where a thousand people died because the building was not up to code and it was full of violations. And all these people who were working in that building who died we're working for subcontractors of subcontractors of all the big, you know, manufacturing, uh, clothes manufacturing companies, both in Europe and the U.S. And almost everybody got caught, uh, you know, uh, lacking uh, in, in having uh, the proper kind of auditing that is necessary, uh, social auditing that's necessary. But one company actually was well equipped to deal with it because they they had the team in place and that's PVH which is a you know a, a Philips Van Heusen a, a shirt making company here in the US they actually have been taking this seriously for many years and they have social auditing teams in house actually that go out and and check out their contractors subcontractors and so on so it can be done and there are experts both potentially internally to a company and uh, externally as consultants okay let's talk about the governance piece a little bit there. What what are the main factors to be looking at on the the G? Yeah, so G is you know G is a big topic. And governance to me incorporates uh, everything that's sort of the legal, regulatory, and compliance piece of a company. So all the laws that you need to observe, but it goes beyond that. It goes to best practices, code of conduct, ethics all the things that have to do with how you want to run your business and how you want to have people treating each other, both internally at the company in terms of uh, also the external stakeholders. And then, of course, governance refers to corporate governance, which is all the mechanisms uh, at the board level and at the structural level for the company that, that is about, um, you know, abiding by filings and other sort of best practices at the board level. Diversity is a big topic in this area as well. And so you have anti-corruption, anti-fraud, anti-money laundering, all of these different things. And then I think one other huge category that belongs under governance is culture and the culture of the organization, which is, you know, to many people a soft topic, but I would argue uh, very vociferously that it's not a soft topic. It actually gets people into big trouble, both financially and reputationally. So that would be sort of a big picture overview of, of the GP, so to speak. And, and T for technology? T for technology is, is something that I've added to this ESG uh, uh, sort of rubric, which has been around for quite a while now. And uh, ESG, as you may know, is something that investors, the investor community has been uh, sort of developing over the last couple of decades, especially in Europe. And now more and more, uh, it's becoming an important thing here in the U.S., but the, the T piece is not in there, partly because I think ESG was born uh, before the technology issues were really as um, overwhelming and pervasive as they are today. And so my idea of including a fourth letter in this ESG and T uh, rubric that I'm suggesting is that we have to include all of these technology issues that are coming at us wildly every single day uh, as we walk down the street, as we read the papers, 
there's always something new, disruptive, transformative that is changing the world as we knew it. And so uh, we have tons of issues cropping up under t- technology that companies and businesses and other kinds of organizations really need to take into account. Cyber happens to be one of them. Privacy issues generally, data, you know, everything having to do with biological, DNA, uh, biotechnology, nanotechnology. There's just one thing after another. And and in the book, I have a a fairly comprehensive list of some of these things, but there's more and uh, everything is changing every day. We have cloud issues. We have, you know, you name it, the people out there who are technologists are inventing new things much faster than we can keep up with them. And last but not least, there are ethics issues involved with every single one of these things. So Technology to me is is this sort of brave, new, somewhat scary, highly opportunistic world that requires all hands on deck and people looking at, at these issues from an ethics and culture standpoint as well as everything else. Could we turn to some of the work that you do in your uh, consulting practice? Could you give us an overview? Sure. My work is mainly with either individual executives such as chief risk officers, general counsels, Uh, chief ethics and compliance officers, sometimes CEOs, uh, and then sometimes with with, uh, executive teams or boards. So I will end up uh, doing a lot of sort of education and training uh, for these kinds of groups. I will do board level workshops, executive level workshops. Uh, Some of the things that I do uh, on that level have to do with reputation risk, which is another area that I've uh, developed a lot of uh, sort of uh, expertise in. I wrote a book about reputation risk about five years ago, which has been used by many for training purposes. And I, I also use that, you know, the sort of framework that I've created there to do uh, customized workshops for clients. And then I also have some ongoing clients. Uh, my One of my biggest clients is a very un- unusual, unique client. It's called the Federal Oversight and Management Board for Puerto Rico, which is a federally created body uh, created by the Congress in 2016 to oversee the fiscal uh, discipline and economic restructuring of Puerto Rico. And that board has a staff and an executive director that work closely with the government of Puerto Rico and with the federal government. Um, And of course, anybody who follows Puerto Rico knows that it's gone through a lot of difficulties uh, first with the economic situation, which, you know, with enormous amounts of debt, then a bankruptcy, then a hurricane or two. And so throughout this, what I do for that board uh, and for the management group is on their independent ethics advisor. So I provide uh, both structured ethical advice that has to do with financial disclosure by the top people in this, uh, uh, in this structure, uh, the board and the management executives. And also conflicts of interest, uh, crisis management when when issues come up, and then a lot of uh, sort of proactive training of the staff uh, to spot issues, to solve issues. So it's almost like being an outside ethics and compliance officer for this body, but I'm independent. So and that's important as well because it allows uh, uh, you know there to be independence and objectivity. So that's a big client, and then I have a couple of other clients that are UN agencies where I provide uh, strategic advice on uh, integrating, for example, an ethics program into uh, the overall business strategy of one of the big UN agencies. And uh, yeah, uh, I'm sometimes I partner with, uh, as I mentioned, the chief risk officer or the general counsel of a company or of an uh, actually of a nonprofit as well uh, to be their strategic partner in thinking through some of their big issues You know, for example, one of the top 10 nonprofit uh, organizations in the U.S., uh, their general counsel became their chief risk officer. And I assist him in figuring out the enterprise risk management program, how to interface with the board and so on and so forth. So so it's uh, it's very diverse. And uh, really, I feel extremely lucky to have such an interesting and diverse practice. That's fantastic. Can you share with, for example, with the work that you do for the Financial Oversight and Management Board for Puerto Rico, like what would an example be? Um, It could be a hypothetical or real of a conflict or interest or other question where you need an ethics advisor. Because my thought is there's probably, there's like three classes of kind of issues. Like there's one big class that 
you know, sort of a non-expert like me would say the answer is kind of obvious, right? Like, right. you know, like, you know, so you don't need an ethics advisor for a big class of problems. Right. A black but, and white kind of an issue. Yeah. Right? Or maybe there's just yeah. two. I mean, there's like a lot of stuff that's black and white. Like, yeah, don't cheat, you know, don't bribe the person, whatever. Sure. So where, like, give us an example of something where it, because it, there's just a lot of gray area that you would need someone with uh, an ethics advisor with, with like yourself, who's, who's really studied this and thought about it a lot. Sure. Um, you know, I can talk about something that's public. So, so uh, you know, I get a lot of smaller things where somebody alleges that somebody has a conflict. And as you just said, when you're not an expert in conflicts, and sometimes when people have an axe to grind, they'll say, oh, that's a conflict of interest. But you have to kind of look at the details and the facts. And so sometimes there will be an allegation that just uh, somebody uh, alleges against someone else. And it may or may not be true. And then you have to sort of get dig into the facts. And so you do a mini investigation, basically asking people questions, looking at documents and then sort of put it, putting it all together and saying, yes, there was a conflict of interest here or an appearance of a conflict. And this is what we're going to do to solve it. Or this is not a conflict of interest. There were no facts to support this. And this is why. So that happens fairly regularly. You just have to sort of walk through the facts. Then there are the sort of bigger situations, and I'll mention one which is public, where a couple of major newspapers last year basically uh, wrote reports about McKinsey, who is one of the third-party service providers to the oversight board, alleging that they had conflicts of interest in the work that they were doing for the board uh, because they also supposedly held Puerto Rican bonds, which is something that you wouldn't want to have at the same time as your, you know, providing financial advice, you know, structuring the economy uh, for Puerto Rico. And so those allegations came out in the newspapers and we conducted an in-depth investigation. The oversight board, uh, together with myself, worked closely with an outside law firm who actually really dug into the details, did a very expansive investigation of the structure of where these bonds were and when they were held. And a big report was produced at the end of that whole process. And that report was publicly filed with the bankruptcy court. um, And it's available for everybody to see. And there were some conclusions uh, that were reached in that report that basically said that even though there was an appearance of a conflict, that it was so far removed from the group that was actually doing the work for the oversight board that it really did not affect um, the people uh, who were working on the particular board projects. And it was something that was remote and had happened a couple of years back. And so we were, they were, the law firm and we, uh, as, as the oversight board, were able to conclude that even though there was no conflict of interest, we actually had eight recommendations that came out of that. And those eight recommendations were basically to beef up what the questions are when you bring in a third party provider into a uh, you know, service contract with the oversight board, how you vet the potential conflicts, so creating much more extensive lists of potential conflicted parties. It gets very granular and very detailed. Also, a bunch of different uh, changes in the contract, that the standard contract between the oversight board and uh, third-party providers. And so uh, we tightened up a lot of the practices, even though they were quite good in the first place, but you can't always catch everything. So we learned lessons from that investigation Uh, which even though it didn't find the conflict, it also made recommendations for improvements. And that's something that I ended up then helping to implement at the oversight board level. Thanks. That's awesome. So I'd like to mention that you were one of Ethisphere's 100 most influential people in business ethics in 2014 and 2015. Tell us a little bit about some of the, so that was one example of, you know, an ethical conflict. What about some work that you do for corporate boards what are some of the ethical questions that that have come up where you've helped provide advice? Gosh, you know, those are, that's a good question. I usually end up doing more educational and workshop kind of work for them rather than solve conflicts of interest at that level. But I do know a bit about that as well. And it's basically, you know, some boards of directors have really good programs in place where they require their board directors at inception, you know, when they're first selected and they come in to declare all of their potential conflicts of interest and to disclose them at all times. 
And then, of course, uh, some some boards are lax about that. So things will happen and, and a conflict will occur and then there's a problem. But other boards are much better about it because they actually require their directors to not only disclose up front, but also disclose annually or even and even the best practice is to disclose it when it happens. And that's something that I actually we actually do at the oversight board as well is uh, we have a very proactive practice of if you think there's a conflict, tell me now, don't wait till someone comes up with it later and says, oh, you have a conflict. So those are the kinds of conflicts issues that could come up on a board level. Now, of course, there you know, have been a lot of issues and scandals potentially uh, in the marketplace where board members um, you know, uh, may have done something improper or illegal. I have not had those kinds of uh, assignments. My assignments with boards has basically been more co- going in and giving them, you know, education updates, workshops on some of the strategic risks and opportunities that exist in the uh, environmental, social governance and technology space. I do some cyber risk oversight as well. Uh, that's an area where I've developed some expertise over the last uh, eight or nine years now where I uh, I help boards figure out what their role is from a cyber governance, uh, cyber risk oversight standpoint. And that's kind of that was an interesting story because that I, I developed that expertise in my last corporate position where I was with a technology company where they asked me to be the head of information security, even though I'm not a technologist. And I had to learn the hard way, you know, what does it mean to be uh, to have good cyber risk governance, good cyber risk management. And so I extrapolated that to work with boards, and I did a couple of major research projects with the conference board about five, six years ago, where we did in-depth uh, sort of research on best practices and cyber risk governance, and that sort of evolved into a number of other things, and now I'm sort of uh, doing a lot of cyber risk governance leadership uh, kinds of uh, issue management at the board level, executive level, and also teaching it at NYU starting next spring. All right. Congratulations. Thank you. You also do some work for the National Association of Corporate Directors uh, mm-hmm. as, as governance faculty. For for folks that aren't familiar with that, tell us a little bit about what does the NACD or National Association for Corporate Directors, what, what do they do? So they're the largest association. They're a nonprofit, the largest association of corporate directors in, in North America. Uh, they also have some foreign uh, members. And it's basically, if you're a member of a board, it could be a nonprofit, it could be for profit. If you're a member from a, a, of a board, you can become a member of the NACD. And then you can go through a variety of educational programs that certify you as a, a certain level of expertise as a board member, all the way up to what they call the governance leadership fellow. And and then they also have corporate board boards, entire boards who are members, and they do a ton of educational work uh, across the year in furtherance of their certifications. They have a big global summit every year, about 2,000 people attend. And so I've been very fortunate in the last seven years that I've had my own business. I've also been a member and faculty for them. I've done you know several programs every year. Uh, mostly in the spaces, obviously, that I'm most expert in, which has to do with uh, ethics, compliance, ESG, cyber. And then we also do, they also uh, do assignments uh, to private clients. So I'm a a part of a faculty of about 40 people uh, who are all corporate directors and, you know, uh, ex-executives who've been on boards and uh, go in and do, you know, one-day, two-day program uh, for the board of directors of company XYZ. Uh, so it's a very diverse, very interesting, great uh, organization. And I uh, very recently became a board member of one of their uh, local chapters, which is the New Jersey chapter of the NACD. And we do a lot of work, uh, you know, a lot of educational things as well, plus a uh, annual awards program in New Jersey for the corporate community there. Uh, so it's a, it's a very interesting and diverse and uh, stimulating group of people and, and activities. So if if I think about kind of a member of the board of directors of a Fortune 500 company, you think of this kind of somewhat austere, remote, like super impressive person. When when you're, you know, serving as faculty and working with those people, what are some of the concerns they have, like the biggest risks and so forth of, um, you know, that, that, that they're worried about, you know? Uh, in terms yeah. of either environmental or financial or 
or or the um, you know the technology getting hacked, cyber. Like, mm-hmm. what are their kind of real personal concerns for for, for the companies that they're around risk? Well, you know, it's interesting. I've seen it evolve even in the seven years that I've been involved with it um, from a much more standard set of issues that, you know, uh, you might categorize in the financial, economic, business planning kind of categories of, you know, making sure the business continues to thrive uh, and or, you know, make money to now really thinking much more about some of these external issues that that I occupy myself with, which are under the categories of ESG and T. And the T piece, of course, uh, the cyber issue is something that's top of mind for boards. They're extremely concerned about it. They're also fairly unprepared to deal with it. And it goes back to a point I made earlier today about diversity on the board. Uh, And when I say diversity, I mean all kinds of diversity, uh, including gender, race, geographic origin and uh, as well as expertise. And I think one of the biggest uh, gaps in boards today is that they don't have enough people with these other lenses, people like myself who have the non-financial set of issues, risks and opportunities that affect business. And so I think they're waking up to uh, a couple of really big ones. One is the cyber one, which is coming out of left field and really hitting hard. Uh, and so there's a lot of activity going on to get boards up to up to speed on cyber. And one of the things I have, for example, is a cyber certificate uh, from Carnegie Mellon and, and ACD that they collaborated on, which is something that they also provide to uh, an ACD and others to to get them up to speed with with cyber basics. Um, but the other big issue, uh, if you just scan the headlines, is the whole issue of culture. And, you know, with the beginning with Me Too and the Weinstein situation a couple, uh, like three years ago now, and actually it's two years, uh, Me Too, uh, Weinstein, uh, Wynn Resorts, um, you know, Uber, there are all these companies, uh, CBS with Les Moonves, all these companies that have CEOs uh, or, you know, other high level executives that have had, uh, you know, either harassment, discrimination, bad behaviors, bullying, whatever you want to call it, taking place. And that's become a major, major reputational issue, potentially financial issue for them. And so they're very concerned about that. And it's not an easy issue to get your arms around. And, you know, with my ethics and compliance and corporate responsibility background, uh, it's it's an area that I have a lot more I guess, facility for and, and, and uh, knowledge about, which uh, if you're a CFO or CEO, you don't necessarily spend a lot of time with those issues. So I think that's become very important. And, and in fact, if you just look at the headlines from the last few days, there's a BlackRock executive who was just dismissed for having an affair with someone on his team. And he was potentially the heir apparent to Larry Fink. So that's a really big deal. And there's been a couple of others. There have been a series of CEOs this year who've been dismissed for for inappropriate relationships, which create cultures, uh, more toxic cultures, because they get a pass when others don't and so on and so forth. For listeners who are consultants and maybe serving a smaller company, that perhaps a company that doesn't have a, a full enterprise risk compliance team, you know, a $10 million revenue or even $100 million revenue company, what are some of the things that we should be thinking about as we advise the CEO or the president or the senior leaders and thinking about these E, S, G, and D, uh, T uh, risks? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, I like to tell people that when I was uh, in the corporate world as an executive, I actually uh, spanned the spectrum of of sizes of companies, too. I was in a couple of startups and then I was in a couple of really big companies And uh, one of the things I learned from that is that every company really needs to do its own customized thing when it comes to risk and compliance and whatever else they need to do, depending on what their business is about, right? So if you're a consulting business where you have a bunch of, um, I don't know, PhDs or JDs or, you know, uh, experts that basically go out and do consulting work, it's one thing. You don't have too many environmental issues there, but you may have some serious governance, risk, compliance issues that have to do with, you know, with making sure that, you know, that fraud isn't committed and corruption doesn't happen and things like that. So what I would say uh, to answer your question more specifically is you have to 
deal with your situation based on the resources you have. It always goes back to who the CEO and the leadership is at the end of the day. And so in, in one of the companies that I was a startup, we were 100 people and I was the general counsel. But I also wore several other hats. I wore the hat of corporate secretary, of chief compliance officer and of chief risk officer. And, you know, while that might be a bit of a conflict, if you're in a much bigger company and you don't want to have the same person sitting uh, on all those different in all those different roles, the bottom line is take the best people you have who are qualified to do certain things and have them wear a couple of hats and bring together cross-functional teams of willing, uh, you know, willing people who who have the eagerness or the interest or the expertise to deal with risk management. I'll, I mentioned to you earlier um, how um, one of my clients is a general counsel who's also become the chief risk officer of a major nonprofit in the U.S. And there, again, they decided, the board of directors of that big nonprofit decided to anoint him as chief risk officer and ask him to create an enterprise risk management system for his organization, which has a lot of risks because of the nature of their business, which is in the health area. And so, they didn't hire a new chief risk officer because it would be too expensive, but they brought, they, they expanded the role of the person that they knew who was capable and interested in doing this. And then that person also gathered sort of a cross-functional team of willing recruits, so to speak, to be part of the enterprise risk management uh, uh, team and get the job done and then take it to the board. So I think every company has to sort of figure out its sweet spot and the, and the people that are willing and able and then work with it. Now, if you don't have the right leaders asking to get that done, then of course you're not going to get it done. Uh, and I found myself in a couple of places where I sort of volunteered myself because I realized nobody was doing something that was really important. But if you don't have people who are thinking outside the box and wanting to do that, then companies end up with the kinds of high risk, potentially high crisis potential that a lot of companies have. Fantastic. Andrea, where can people find you online and learn more about your work? Well, thank you for asking. Um, I have a very full website full of resources and information under my company name, which is GEC Risk, all one word, dot com. GEC, by the way, stands for Governance, Ethics, and Cyber. And on that website, you can find book pages for my books that, that I've written. Uh, you can find resources under six different categories of things that I do, including governance and ethics and, and cyber, et cetera. Then some of the uh, articles and interviews that I've had over the years, uh, the team page, people that I work with, and uh, yeah, some, some videos as well. And you can also find my contact information on my website, which uh, gives you my email address, and phone number. And um, I also tweet uh, quite regularly as at global ethicist, uh, something I, I found in my head about eight or nine years ago when I first started tweeting. And I'm also on LinkedIn. I do a lot of posting on LinkedIn. I try to comment on current affairs as I see them popping up issues. We have issues every day. So I try to um, uh, provide a couple of added value sort of commentary on some of the things that I see in, in, in uh, everyday corporate and even geopolitical life. So thank you for asking. Those are the, those are the answers. Fantastic. Well, Andrea, thank you so much for being on the show. Well, thank you so much for having me, Will. I really appreciate it. 